Dan Burkholder. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Joanne. Thanks for you all for coming here tonight. And what we're going to do at first, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of photography. What could be more boring, right? But let's try to demystify it. One of the reasons many of us are drawn to this medium in the first place is because it's always been about change. And I tell people, if you don't like change, you pick the wrong medium. Maybe try something like pottery instead, where the one advancement has been moving from the foot-driven potter's wheel to the electrically driven potter's wheel. So if you're resistant to change, that might be a much more comfortable place for you. Now, I've been in photography now. I, got, I was talking to a... Uh, I'm all earlier with, I got like two decades in the classic era of photography, which where you dealt with chemically based silver sensitized materials, and now a couple decades in digital imaging. And the term pioneer is often bandied about, but people tell me I should call myself a pioneer. I'm not sure if I should or not. But I want to show you something here, and there I just got my message popped up. Let me back up here a couple of things. My slideshow is going the wrong direction. Here we go. The, between the two asterisks there on the left, you have approximately the first 60 years of the medium. The total number of photographs made during that first 60 years are now exceeded in three minutes with the uploads to Facebook. So we have 60 years of time, the beginning of the medium compressed. Uh, this next little boring slide, you can see right, around 2005-ish that all the image making films, silver sensitized materials, just started to go off a cliff. And that's no secret. How many of you still shoot film in here? Very few of you. I can't see all of your hands, but there probably are none. So it's no secret that digital is the mainstream method of making images now. It's not the only method. I'm certainly very involved. We're going to see some images that kind of go back to um, my history in photography. And this image, for instance, is not uh, digital. This is this a composite, but it's done in the wet darkroom. Some of you may have heard of Jerry Ulsman, who's one of my mentors, who would use up to eight matched enlargers in the dark room to print in different parts. So I'm going to show you a few images that deal with what I call the transition from classic to digital imaging. And I'm going to try to avoid that term analog. Um, do should still look at the Getty Museum. I sat in there, actually we were sitting on a train in Europe and talking about this, and he liked, he liked it that there was the classic era of photography, and now we're in the digital era. And I thought that was such an elegant way of differentiating between that era of optical projection uh, chemical amplification of the image, and now we're in the digital era. And this will not be the final era in photography, just as cell phone photography will not be. We'll have, we may be sculpting with gamma rays in 15 years, who knows? But that's part of the thrill, part of the ride of photography, the change. So here's an image, there's nothing digital about this. It's, it's one of my favorite images in my portfolio, but this was shot, what was that old timey stuff we used to put in, film, film, film that we used to put in our cameras. So this is, this is going back several decades. So it was shot on film, but processed with a paper developer to pop an intentional grain. But more than that, on that first silver print, I would, with brushes and potassium ferrocyanide, which is a photographic bleaching agent, actually paint bleach onto the image to elevate tones. Now, we do all those things either in Photoshop or Lightroom or on our iPhones or Androids now. Um, there's nothing, this next image, there's nothing digital about this. This was shot in India. I shot this on film and used flash fill so that the pilgrim washing or sorry in the river wouldn't be purely silhouetted. But nothing digital about that. So let's move on to yet another image. Well, this one, back 20 years ago, I can't believe it's been that long, I wrote this book called Making Digital Negatives for Contact Printing because I found a way to use the computer for contact printing processes. How many of you know what platinum printing is? It's an old historic printing process. The final print, the grays and blacks in that final print are metallic platinum and palladium. And you start by hand coating a light sensitive uh, a sensitizer on the paper, a good cotton black paper. It has the consistency of uh, like burnt coffee. And you have to have a negative the same size as your print. So you either have to shoot with a big camera or somehow generate a big negative. So I wrote this book on how to do that because so many people were, were approaching me saying, how are you doing this? I thought, well, if I'm going to train the competition, I might as well make a buck in the process. So this book came out. So then I could do things like this. Uh, the man lifting catfish with penis. And you know the, the background, he was standing on dry ground. This is a composite. This is digital. This was done in Photoshop back, oh gosh, in 1994. So we're going back 20 years on this. So the, um, the man, was, he was standing on dry ground lifting this heavy 120 pound rock with this loop of cloth around particular parts of his body. I've tried the same thing. You might notice I can actually 
I hold down on the screen, I love Keynote on the iPhone, I can actually uh, hide, it turns into a little laser pointer. Now if I move it quickly, it actually becomes like a psychedelic sperm cell. That kind of, <laughs> you see that, Kai Cole? Don't you wish you could do that? But notice the tendons in his neck that are standing out. That's the point I wanted to make, believe it or not. Um, that happens to me when I try that. My, except my tongue also comes out of the side of my mouth. And then this image, the pigs in frozen paradise. Um, I could do this. Now this is expressed as a 12 by 18 inch platinum print, which is actually a, a very lovely thing. Um, you know, my wife, and who's in the audience, she says I have a talent for making images that no one wants to buy. But, uh, but and this is not meant to be an anti-religious statement. I mean, I photographed the pigs down in Mexico and this church in Mexico, but when I got back and was looking at proof sheets, this was shot on film way back, um, it just seemed like they had to be united in, in this way. So, so then, um, get on a more serious note, Back eight years ago, after at the end of 2005, you may remember Hurricane Katrina just smacked into the, the Gulf Coast of the United States. Um, Jill and I talked about the need to get to New Orleans to photograph and see what both governmental failure and Mother Nature had done to the citizens. So I'm just going to show you, and this is just historical context, show you some of these images. And I photographed these with a technique called high dynamic range, HDR. So this is the inside of a church there in New Orleans, and you may notice those up on the ceiling, that the, uh, the fan blades up there, they're, t they're melted over because they were underwater for two weeks. Um, this, this part of the, uh, the town in the Lower Ninth Ward was hardest hit, it was the lowest area of the town. And this was, uh, every, one of, every one of the images that ended up being a book were between six and 16 different exposures. So high dynamic range is a technique where we take different exposures from light to dark and meld via software that tonality together to get much better shadow detail, much better mid-tones, and much better highlight detail. It's become something, a very standard thing in photography, but eight years ago, it was kind of an adventurous thing when I did this. In fact, my book ended up, it was the first coffee table book done entirely with high dynamic range techniques. This is the high school auditorium there in New Orleans. And this is the last image that's in the book called The Color of Law, so you'll see the cover coming up. And this was a ch in a church, a hymnal sitting on a pew and I just love the way over here on the left, there's a, there is a stem that comes in and leaning against the book, you see like some pine needles and it's very difficult to see where the organic material ends and where, the, where that man-made stuff begins. And, and I print this as a large 20 by 30 inch print, you can read the, the words like Lord, Mercy in the text of the hymn, it's, it's a, quite moving. So then after that, there's the cover from the book, The Couple Lost. I wanted to take high dynamic range techniques into the landscape, and I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of landscape images, but I do want to show you something uh, that I did in a hotel room when I was presenting a couple years ago down in Florida, and it was late at night, the brothels had closed early, so you know, I, I'm there with the, this is my room with one lamp on above the bed and one off, so that's a straight shot, and then I set the camera up, you know, I'm there by myself, so I'm going to do photography, so there's the, the high dynamic range version of the image. Now, I didn't turn the other light on or anything else, but what I want to show you, and I get so tickled when photography shows its own hand, we're going to zoom in on the clock that's on the, on the nightstand down there, and it's 10.98 p.m. <laughs> now, that's because this was a series of maybe 10 different exposures that took several minutes, and as the little LED segments went on and off, they were, were melted together. In a nutshell, high down in the range takes the best midtones from every shot, so it assembled and created a time that does not exist. And I love it. I always tell students and colleagues that it's not called reality, it's called photography. <laughs> if you want reality, that's that three-dimensional thing out there that you can wrap your arms around. You know, photography is taking a wild, wacky, three-dimensional world and putting it on a flat piece of paper. That's a massive departure from reality. So then iPhone photography, of course, the, the, the big thrust of what I'm all about right now is just so exciting. Um, and how, do, do any of you have a phone with a camera in it? Maybe a, maybe a few of you. I mean, it's become so cliche. It's just, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, I tell people all the time, there's no virtue to difficulty. You don't get points for doing anything the hard way. You get points for making an image or a print that stops us in our tracks. That's all you get points for. No one cares if you used a big camera, a cell phone, hiked 20 days into the wilderness, or did it in your bathroom. They don't care. They just want to know, what's that final image? Does it have some soul and spirit to it? So, of course, when I first got my first phone with a camera, it actually wasn't even an iPhone. It was this Palm Trio. Some of you may remember that horrible device. 
So I would use it for taking things like where I parked in the, uh, in the uh, airport parking lot. And I still do that, it's a great use. When I write it down, just take a picture of where you're parked so when you get back a week or so later you know. And then I started doing the, the classic things of taking pictures of pets. Like that's our cat, Smudgy Bear. And uh, of course here's Smudgy Bear in his astronaut outfit. Now, you may not know this, but it's much more expensive to get a small astronaut outfit like this, custom made. And I'm not going to take the time to show you in settings, but I have over 700 apps on my phone. If, you know, they have those TV programs called Hoarders. They should have programs called App Hoarders. And I could lose a third or half of these apps right now, and I would never miss them. But I'm loath to throw them away because, just like, just like on the Hoarders show, someday I might find a use for that. You know? But I never will, but I can't, I can't bring to myself. If I hover around 700, I feel I'm doing well. Okay, now this is, that was one of my only disappointments with the 5S, is that it didn't come with a 128 gig version. I'm out of space, give me more space. So you know the next one. Who would buy a 16 gig you know, smartphone at this point? It's absurd. Okay, so and then after doing those things, I got excited with stitching, that is shooting sequential images overlapping. And not just single row, I mean, single row panos are very nice. We saw some beautiful ones up there when we were looking at those photos before the three uh, speakers started here. But I wanted to do three-dimensional stitching. So this is the final product, but look at the series from which that came. There are the 19 images from which that came. Now this screenshot was done in Lightroom, but only so you'd see the entire rectangular image. Um, if I had taken that screenshot on the phone, it would truncate it down to a square and you wouldn't get a good feel. So those 19 images were stitched with an app I had to save up for it. Well, how many of you have auto stitch? I mean, I had to save up for a couple weeks, $1.99. You know, and, it's, and it's magical. I mean. The, but if you sell a couple million of anything for $1.99, we're still talking serious green, aren't we? I mean, this whole thing of micro-marketing, it's magical. So these apps, um, so there's the final image, all the texture, the stitching, the texture, the contrast control, the color, all done on the iPhone. And people say, would you also work on the iPad? Well, once in a while, but there's just something intoxicating about being able to wake up at 3 in the morning and grab your phone off the nightstand and start editing images. If someone had told me 20 years ago I'd be doing this, I'd say, you're full of it, you know, it's complete nonsense. This is also a stitch from about 30 images, handheld, standing on a bridge up by Catskill. We live right at the base of the Catskills. So this is the creek. Um, that's actually the uh, throughway going over Catskill, or going over the creek. Um, this, you know where this is, down in Grand Central. I teach, in fact, I was just there a couple weeks ago teaching at the International Center of Photography. And it, when the class ended, walking back to um, Grand Central, just shot this with the iPhone, and of course stylized it. Now I'm going to show you, this is a before and after. Um, Jill and I presented a couple years ago um, up actually up at b &H Photo, and we were going home, and I was driving, and Bill was in the passenger seat. We were going across George Washington Bridge towards Jersey, and it was raining, and we've all done that thing where we try to shoot through the windshield and try to time it so the windshield wiper's not in the picture, right? So I said to Jill, I said, Jill, can you steer? I've got to take some pictures. She said, I'm not going to steer in the rain going across the George Washington Bridge in traffic. I said, well, someone should because I'm doing photography. So, so, that, so that got her attention, and she, of course, she was a good, good, good sport and displayed all the people honking as we kind of weave their way across. But that's the original shot. And you can, you know, I don't know if you can see, you might be able to see a few of those little raindrops on the windshield, because it was raining. And there's the final image. And I like to describe it, I'm going through my Steichen phase. And you know, Steichen was one of my photographic heroes. And that his, his choice of colors, that aquamarine, I was trying to emulate, um, you know, uh, you know say the imitation is the best form of flattery. But you might have noticed that that was not cropped. This is square. Let me see if I can go back here. That image is the native 3 by 4 aspect ratio. 3 by 4 it's a rectangle. But this one, and notice where the car headlights over on the left are. The final image, everything is still there. So I didn't crop it, but I squeezed it. So this is an iPhone image, but I made a digital negative, print this on a very thin vellum, very sensuous, very thin translucent vellum. And in platinum, and then after it's dried, I varnished the varnish the vellum to make it even more translucent and put 24 karat gold leaf on the back. So the light's going through the vellum hitting the gold leaf and it becomes a very different thing. And it becomes something you can't get from an inkjet printer. I love inkjet printing. It's the standard way of making photographs now. But that doesn't mean non-standard ways aren't going to be really lovely. And I especially like it when you can't get look, a look um, you know, in any other way except something that's alternative. Uh, this is, I've been lucky to teach a couple workshops in Italy on iPhone. Believe, can you believe people go all the way to Venice and Florence to learn iPhones? Um, but I'm certainly happy they do. Um, so this is a shot. And this, this is HDR on the iPhone. So you saw those New Orleans pictures, which were HDR. Well, now we have apps like Vivid HDR that they're rather limited. They take three exposures, highlight, midtone, shadows, and melt them together. But you get this lush, incredible detail, much better than you can get from any one picture. There's an app called Slow Shutter. This was handheld eight seconds as this cruise ship in Venice was leaving the town. 
And I was able to, you know, even at my age, I could hold it still relatively for, for eight seconds. <laughs> and this, this is a picture we just did. We were there in October, and we were driving along out in the Tuscan countryside, and these sheep are being moved around by a, a shepherd. That's what their job is, right? So um, I jumped out of the car and ran over the iPhone and took this with this app called Vivid HDR, and it took three pictures, like click, 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 and I thought, oh, shit, I'm going to have moving, I'm going to have moving sheep in here. But it didn't because the one exposure was probably for this dark foreground. The midtones then were exposed, and then the third exposure was for the, uh, the sky. So when it combined those, it, it didn't show the motion. And I, I love that when stuff like that happens. Every, every little sheep is tacked sharp. I'll talk, you've heard the joke about the three lies that a farmer tells. You know, that's only mud on my boots. Uh, yes, I paid for that hat, and I was only helping the sheep across the fence. So anyway, that just came to mind. Here's another one for the Tuscan countryside. Um, of course, this is all iPhone in here, and it was just a magical time. This I just uh, how many show up in, uh, a couple weeks ago up in uh, Albany, and uh, I'm putting these on vellum in color and putting gesso on the back, and they just become very beautiful kind of objects. I love small prints where they become objects. And we'll jump. This, I was on an airplane, spent a lot of time like some of you on airplanes, and this fellow was in the window seat, there was someone sleeping in the middle row, so I turned the sound off and kind of clandestinely held the phone down and shot this fellow, and he, I just love it, stylized it something. He looks like a cross between a character in Mad Men and a Jehovah's Witness. And, <laughs> just all that, kind of, that kind of stoic rigidity, and you know you wouldn't like him if you actually talk to him. <laughs> you know, you know that. Now this is one shot that was not done on the iPhone. Remember we're talking about, it's all about putting things together in different new ways. That's the spirit of photography. This was shot 12 years ago with a Nikon Coolpix camera. I was in the Czech Republic reviewing this camera to write a magazine article, and I shot this and could never in Photoshop, or then later in later, I could never bring it to fruition. I couldn't get the feel out of it that I wanted. So last summer, I sent it over from the computer over to the iPhone and started working on it where we have this plethora of textural controls, color, contrast, composition. And this was another one where I squeezed it down from three to four to, to three by three. So it, 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 you can see how it gets a more of a fanciful feel. And I'm really having a lot of fun with that. So this is what was, did not start as iPhone, but ended up. Now we have cameras. How many of you are shooting with Olympus of Micro Four Thirds cameras? Anyone? It's just, it's the cat's meow. It's a wonderful. If you need, when you need better quality, when you need better low light performance, better optics, Micro Four Thirds is where the action is. Mirrorless cameras. I sold all my Nikon and Canon gear two years ago and never looked back. A New Orleans with a fisheye attachment for the iPhone. So it's one of the benefits of the iPhone where they're not popping out a new model like rabbits, you know, in a box in your backyard. So because each phone has a couple year lifespan, third party manufacturers are able to come out with different add-on gizmos like this fisheye lens from Holoclip. Uh, going running an errand, this is just uh, back in the fall, up by, by right on the way to Catskill. This is the corn silos in the morning fog. There's this beautiful morning fog. Stopped again on the way around the air, and that's the uh, rail bridge there in Catskill. Shot that. And of course, worked on it. And this is an image of an old hotel, Cold Spring Hotel, up at the top of the mountain. We're in Palinville, right at the base of the mountain. If you've ever gone skiing to Hunter, you've gone through a little one stop lake town. But this is up on the top. And this was shot with the Olympus that has a camera that has built in Wi Fi. You don't need any existing Wi-Fi infrastructure. You could be in the backwoods of Dumbfuckistan, and you could, send, you could send the images from your camera over to your iPhone or iPad where you can start working on it, or Android if, you, if you're so inclined. So it's just it's a magical world where we can you know, do all these kind of things differently. It's absolutely thrilling. Coming down to New York City, I always like to photograph in the train, Metro North, you know where that is, coming into town. And then when I was down here just a week and a half ago teaching a workshop at ICP, this was Bryant Park in the snow. On that one day, it was a beautiful evening shot with the iPhone. And uh, there was, this is actually a demo image up on 8th Avenue when I was doing another class, shot through the window with Vivid HDR and then worked over and with the Empire Steel Building. And I just love when things happen like that. And um, this was shot with the Olympus Wi Fi over to the iPad where I stylized it so I could have different optics, telephoto, etc., but yet still have the, have the look and feel and the control of the apps with the iPhone, which is wonderful. And in nine days, it'll hit the stands. This is the volume 22 of Peterson's Photographic. If you're interested in learning more about this, I wrote the entire issue that's coming out. So a week from Friday, it should be hitting the stands. So grab it. I mean, I don't, I, mean, I, I get paid the same amount whether you buy it or not. But get it if you want to learn more about iPhone apps and Android apps. And I always like to finish up here. Oh, this is a little video. If I got the sound plugged in here far enough, make sure that's in there. 
Um, this, this is the kind of thing that happens at my iPhone workshops. I want you to see this little 15 second video. Well, we're back from our field trip, and there's Molly and George, they're working on all their wonderful iPhone images. <laughs> Action movie FX, which is what, 99 cents? <laughs> but, but there are add-ons. I think I'm into like about $700 worth of add-ons at this point. No, maybe maybe $6 worth. You get some extra effect. No, it's magic. If you had had one of these 15 years ago, you could have at least been leader of a small country. <laughs> it's incredible. You take it for granted, but Jesus Christ, it's amazing. Okay. So... I'm going to wind up here pretty shortly. Words to live by. I'm actually near the end. Um, words to live by. This is a real fortune cookie. Jill and I were in a Chinese restaurant back a couple years ago. And um, I opened up my fortune cookie. And I don't know about you, but I'm actually pretty disappointed in today's fortune cookies. There should be a class action suit against the people. They're not fortunes anymore. They're observation cookies. It is a ripoff. So, so I got this. I said, well, this is great. So I said, Jill, hold this. So I took a picture of it. And this is the actual, this is not Photoshop, this is the real fortune cookie. You are capable, competent, creative, prove it. So this was a challenge, a challenge cookie. So, so I'm going to end on this note. This is your challenge. We're going to assume that you're capable, competent, creative, prove it. Thank you very much.